So it's often cited that the semiconductor industry goes in cycles. Supply, demand, supply, demand, who's winning, what the hot topic is, who's at the top. And, you know, I hate to say it, but the buzzwords of machine learning and artificial intelligence are right up there. Billions upon billions have been invested, and even the experts say we're just touching the tip of what's possible with machine learning. If you've watched any of my videos before, you may remember that I've mentioned that two of those billions of dollars that have been invested into machine learning have gone into IBM's AI hardware center. We've recently covered their new artificial intelligence unit chip, the AIU, and the benefits of a silicon to software full stack solution, with important questions like why foundational models are going to be important for the future of machine learning. But if IBM has invested two billion in AI over five years, and all we have from that investment is a chip and some software, is that it? In this video, we're going to highlight the four orthogonal pillars of IBM's AI hardware center. It's digital compute, analog compute, packaging, and finally, usable products. But first, a potato eating a wafer. So one aspect of talking about the industry I enjoy is working out how things come together. So it's all very well reeling off a bunch of speeds and feeds for the latest chip, but what I think a lot of other YouTubers industry peers miss is the thought process that actually gets us there. Ideas and products don't just appear on a whim, and a device you're watching this on, even if it's a beat up $75 Chromebook or similar potato, has been built requiring a thousand different disciplines, each with tens of thousands of people spending tens of thousands of hours on it, and one little thing that they're focused on each. We're talking everything from the atoms inside your transistor to the elements used in your transistor, to the transistor, to the manufacturing, each one of those 100 plus layers of construction, then testing, implementation, the tools behind it, validation, verification, and the mountains of software that run on these things. As a result, simply focusing on one area means you're not looking at the big picture of how it came to be, the strategy behind it, the people behind it, and where it's going next. I mention this because it's a big criticism of the AI hardware market right now. We've got dozens of companies making chips. Most are relying on work done by others. They're licensing cores, they're licensing IP, they're manufacturing it at, the, at a leading edge fab, and then falling down the rabbit hole of if the hardware doesn't perform, the custom IP block doesn't perform, or the software isn't, is a, you know, more than two years from being ready. There's a great slide from Jim Keller, the CTO of Tens Torrent, about how it can be really easy to get funding to start an AI company, but really hard to do, actually do anything worthwhile. Now, most of these AI startups are small, 15 people to 400 people to 1,000 people. They are focused, dedicated teams, and it's really the ones that can A, build a complete solution, and B, make it price competitive that will succeed. What about hardware from the established players, for example? Some of them just buy a startup, they amplify it to the max, and even then, it still might fail. We've got plenty of examples of that, but a failed chip doesn't fail the company. The AI chips these make could only be one angle of a portfolio, so it could be considered not as cutthroat, and they can take their time, leverage partnerships with big customers, and invest. If it's that investment which is the key part of it all. If your goal is to build a strong revenue base, one chip or one product isn't going to cut it. There needs to be a roadmap, which is something startups have a hard time realizing as they put a lot of eggs into that make or break product basket. The roadmap can be product and it can be research. So IBM's AI hardware center was built around this established player model. An initial $2 billion investment for five years started in 2019, along with some additional funding through partnerships. And in this instance, the goal here isn't simply to build a chip. It's building a solution and not just one. Yeah, so the AI Hardware Center, uh, we announced that in 2019. It's a $2 billion investment over five years. And uh, we looked at the full stack approach. And in that, there are four pillars uh, that we have identified where we want to focus on. One is around course and architecture, where we develop new course every year as a part of our AI Hardware Center initiative. Second pillar is around uh, analog AI, which is like a longer term approach as we develop low precision cores. What can we do at the materials level? So that's working towards analog AI core approach. 
uh, third pillar is uh, around uh, heterogeneous integration. Like how do you, how do you bring memory uh, close to compute in an AI world? How do you develop that heterogeneous integration environment or process technology for AI workload? And the fourth pillar is around uh, test bed. How do you test these things? How do you develop, uh, you know, how do you develop first a simulation environment so that you can simulate these cores and then you build these cores and being able to test those cores in a real, you know, application or real uh, cloud environment. And for that, we actually have uh, uh, supercomputers which we are using for uh, AI test bed to be able to both simulate these cores as well as, as, well as test out uh, the, the, the course and the chips that we are developing as a part of AI hardware center. So those are the four pillars. These pillars are, to an extent, self-standing, but each has a crossover point with the others to enable independent advancement to come together. So the first pillar, pillar one, cores and architecture. This first pillar is the one most familiar to us. On this channel, whenever I cover new hardware chips, or you'll see in an upcoming project I'm working on, a critical aspect of the machine learning hardware ecosystem is simply getting the architecture right. With standard compute, we're 40 plus years into x86 microarchitectures, and they are still extracting performance. So with the rate of change of how machine learning as a field is advancing, pretty fast, yeah. Continual research in the best way to represent the compute in silicon is paramount, and all the major players are doing it. So in that instance, manipulating bits in digital cores is relatively easy, but doing it the right way and implementing the latest techniques at speed is hard as it depends on what you want it to do. Industry has adopted different terms for different types of compute. For example, scalar compute for simple programs on individual elements, or vector compute for one-dimensional arrays. We also have matrix compute for multi-dimensional arrays, and then spatial compute for when those arrays are connected in a complex way. Depending on the compute, it matters whether memory is near or far, and how accurate the math engines are also plays a role in machine learning. It also matters how you represent the data. How many bits you assign to each data point correlates to both accuracy, but the fewer bits, the faster you go. For those unfamiliar with what I mean by this, it's the concept of quantization or reduced precision. It merits another video entirely, but the way you represent numbers in binary matters. If you normally use 32 bits to represent numbers, but instead choose to use 8 bits, you can keep the accuracy of your machine learning model with the right hardware, you can also achieve 4x speed up, although the hardware needs to support it and the model still needs to remain accurate. Most of the machine learning world today uses 32 bits, while a large chunk look at 16 bits and specialized versions have 8 bits. And there is even special nuance to that, which as I said, probably merits a video in its, on its own. For context here, IBM is already going down as far as 4 bits and looking at how 2 bits can still be as accurate as other alternatives. So for cores, IBM is committing here to a new generation of machine learning IP every year. The latest generation is in two different products already, a single core in the Telem chip that forms the basis of the Z16 system and Linux One mainframe offerings, and the more recently announced 32 core chip in the AIU. The next two or three generations are already in the works, all looking at this concept of reduced precision, but also the concepts of analog computing cores, which is our next pillar, or multi-chip based cores. Finally, the roadmap is leading to teraops per watt, or 1000x, where we are today. IBM's research into analog artificial intelligence compute starts with a humble data storage cell. A phase change memory cell stores data through its resistance, which can change when a big enough voltage is applied. In order to overcome one of the fundamental limiters in modern machine learning today, the power consumption required when moving that data, IBM is using these phase change memory cells to store activation weights of a given machine learning layer. An electrical pulse is applied to the cell, changing its resistance to a value between 0 and 1, rather than specifically a 0 or a 1. Because this changes the crystalline structure inside the cell, the value is stored in a non-volatile way, and can be kept for up to 10 years even when powered off. Using these program cells, an analog matrix vector multiplication can occur in a single time step, with activations taken directly from DRAM rather than an associated cache, saving even more power. This is a more advanced take on in-memory compute devices that some other vendors are researching today, and IBM has already demonstrated test silicon, such as this Fusion chip. 
Using multiple phase change memory cell arrays up to 200,000 cells each, the chip was able to recognize handwritten digits in 0 to 1 time, i.e. 1 per cycle, regardless of complexity. Part of the research here right now is proof of concept, while other research into usable IP is predicting a minimum 4 orders of magnitude better power efficiency compared to state-of-the-art CPUs and GPUs today. The third pillar is all about how to package multiple chips together, also known as heterogeneous integration. Now this pillar might feel a little odd to some. Packaging, you mean like chiplets? Normally we speak about products with chiplets and special connectivity when we look at TSMC packaging, or Intel's EMIP, or AMD's Stack Vcache, or other things. It's very rare for IBM to be in that conversation, in our circles at least, but truth be told, IBM's been there for decades. I'm just going to point out a video by Dave Jones on EEV blog where he opens, or delids in the loosest sense of the word, a retro IBM processor. Inside the oil-filled, spring-mounted, sealed monstrosity are hundreds of chips, some memory, some compute, and they are not even soldered down. It's a very insane thing to look at. But suffice to say, IBM has been at this for a while. That being said, there's still a lot of work to be done. One of the big talking points in this area is direct bonding. Stacking two chips together with zero solder bumps on the scale down to single digit microns. Intel currently has plans to come down to 10 microns. AMD and TSMC are already selling 9 micron with stacked Vcache. And IBM is in that game as well as part of their third pillar. IBM is researching into the three key areas. High density laminates such as RDL. Silicon bridges such as EMIB or EFOB which is on AMD's uh, MI250X and 3D stacked integration. On top of this is also cooling, given that AI chips are coming up to 1000 watts plus. Results from the research in this pillar are aiming to be integrated into the first pillar of cores and architecture. So while these first three pillars are all the hardware to compute and how to put the hardware together, the fourth pillar is the software side of it, and arguably IBM's largest part. If you've seen my recent video with Dr. Gershon, you may have heard of this thing called a full stack solution. As I mentioned in my introduction, it's not simply enough to build a chip. Any monkey with a bunch of IP and an EDA license could put a chip together, at least probably. But the chips still need to be accessed, usable, easy to use, and scalable. Most of that happens post silicon validation for the software tools, and those tools are needed. IBM calls its fourth pillar end use testbed, which when I hear it makes it think makes it sound more experimental. But the aim here is to get the AI Hardware Center partners involved in actually using the hardware created from the first three pillars in a way that makes sense and doesn't require months of understanding. This means we're talking about software tools, applications, libraries, and infrastructure support to enable all of the end use requirements for that chip. It's a stack or a suite. It's all about making sure those using the hardware are not only asking the right questions, such as how machine learning is going to be useful for their organization or the organization's customers, but also having access to hardware and hardware at scale. As with any new technology with wide implications, some people create the hammers and nails, while others use that their experience to take the raw materials and either create value or art. It has to be as seamless as possible, with a full stack solution acting essentially as the lubricant. If a company becomes part of the AI Hardware Center's mission, do they get some early access? Yes, that's right. You do. Uh, and that's the whole idea of creating this community so that they get to see on a monthly basis. Every month they can see progress that we are making. And then they can make their own plans uh, or contribute towards uh, uh, accelerating the progress that we are making together. And how does one become a member of the AI Hardware Center? Ah, we have a website uh, for AI Hardware Center. You can reach out to that, or you can contact me as well. And uh, we will welcome uh, you know, more uh, members to participate. We have uh, 19 members who are part of AI Hardware Center. Uh, we grew from, uh, since we launched this uh, in 2019. And we expect to have more members uh, join and uh, in the journey of co-creation. We believe, again, we believe in partnership. We believe in you know, collectively you know, working together and creating better uh, technology. It's the current fast-paced AI environment that no large customer wants to devote six months and a dozen engineers just to get their stuff to run, let alone optimized. One startup can often optimize their flow for one or two customers, but then building something applicable to everyone is a couple of orders of magnitude harder. So I know the question you're asking, what's the end goal here? 
IBM doesn't sell AI hardware today. They only have one product that's focused, that's only just coming online, and it'll be focused on a few key customers. Why should we care? Are they trying to make it as big as an NVIDIA competitor, or is it just research? For that, we have to look at IBM's business model. If we take the simple view of revenue generation, then IBM isn't as consumer-facing as it used to be in the 80s and 90s. A lot of IBM's revenue comes from consulting services. A lot of it comes from licensing, some of it from systems, and some from its own product portfolio. A good amount of that, a good amount of customers to IBM fall into multiple buckets, such as customers on IBM Cloud are often customers using consulting services, which means IBM aims to leverage the synergy between the two. If licensing can build a better product portfolio and the customers want both the product and the consulting, or consulting and the product, that's IBM's goal. For IBM here, a strong customer is one that aims for multiple parts of IBM's business. A customer that licenses IP but contributes to the AI hardware center, for example, make it helps make IBM's own products better. My final takeaway is this. IBM understands that machine learning hardware is more than just a chip. It's been clear in the semiconductor space in the last few years that if you do not treat hardware and software as equals and co-design with both in mind, then any product is pretty much dead on arrival for all but the most well-funded institutions. I mean, that concept isn't new, but if IBM compare that with the concepts of reduced precision in digital cores, enabling amazing performance per watt with analog cores, and combine that with 3D integration at scale, then there are a few companies with the resources to do so. For example, one of IBM's most famous experiments was Watson. Not only that machine we remember from the Jeopardy game show, but a philosophy that underpins a lot of IBM's offerings today. A successful run in machine learning research and reduction could lead to the next Watson moment for IBM.